Sean Carroll is a Senior Research Associate at Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, specialising in general relativity and dark matter. He is also one of the world's leading popularisers of science and a notable figure on public lecture circuits in both America and Europe. He is the author of From Eternity to Here, which addresses both general relativity and the arrow of time and the particle at the end of the universe, a book about the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. He holds a PhD in physics from Harvard University and in this interview and discussion he talks about the problems found when comparing the everyday experience of the flow of time with certain laws of physics and explains why we may have to redefine space and time in order to gain a more comprehensive understanding of time. Clearly our existence as we know it in terms of cognitive understanding of the world is dependent on time we're born we grow up we grow old we die we see this in the natural world around us as well but clearly in the laws of physics time is not that simple in fact it's often quite problematic so what are some of the most fundamentally complex issues regarding time in physics i think it's a great question and it's a subtle one because part of me wants to say that time is not as mysterious as some people make it out to be. I think that it's, it's not as if, you know, we have no idea what time is, how to use it, where it comes from. If I say, you know, let's have dinner at 7 p.m., you know what that means. You're not, you know, frozen with confusion. Like, you know, what is this weird language this guy is talking? Um, and I think that we, you know, slide past that in our discussions of time. But, you know, let, let's put it on the table that we use time very effectively. We kind of understand it at a very operational level. Time also has features. It has properties like the fact that we can remember the past but not the future, like the fact that we're all born young and then grow older. And these properties are more difficult to understand. I would say that we kind of understand them halfway. We have a basic framework that tells us why these things are true, but many of the details remain to be worked out. And the, there's this big looming question about why things were set up the way they were 14 billion years ago at the Big Bang. And finally, there's always the fact that even though the possibility that even though we think we have a basic good working understanding of time and how it operates, maybe that's just an approximation to some much deeper notion of time that we just don't have a clue about quite yet. You said um, what aspects are mysterious and what aspects aren't mysterious. So clearly, we do understand time in everyday situations and also going back to the Big Bang. Uh, what are some of the most mysterious elements of time and what are some of the notions of the more fundamental aspects of time that we might not have realised as of yet? Well, I think that my particular interest is in the arrow of time. Uh, so there's the fact that time exists, which is not that mysterious. I mean, time, as Einstein taught us, is much like space. It's a label. It helps us locate events in the universe. If you're going to meet someone for dinner at 7 p.m., you need to tell them where and when. Those are the two facts. And we kind of understand space, and we kind of understand time just as well. One big difference is that time has this directionality, that we feel like we're flowing from the past to the future, that the time is moving, whereas in space we can sort of move around however we want. And I said that we sort of understand that halfway because we have a story that we can tell, which is true, about entropy increasing. The fact that there's this thing called the second law of thermodynamics that says that the entropy of the universe, which is a way of measuring its disorderliness or randomness or disorganization, was very low in the past. So the early universe, or even yesterday for that matter, was more orderly, less random than the later universe or today or tomorrow. And that's an interesting fact, but uh, why is it true? Well, there's things we understand and things we don't. Ludwig Boltzmann, famous uh, Austrian physicist, helped explain why entropy would very, very naturally increase toward the future. Things get messier over time. This is not really surprising when you think about it, right? Your room gets messier over time. Shuffle cards, they shuffle together and they don't unshuffle. But what he didn't explain, what we still are confused about, is why it was ever lower in the past. So we understand sort of why if the entropy of the universe was low in the past, it was a very orderly place, then the entropy would increase, but we don't understand why it was ever low in the past to begin with, and that's a question for cosmology, for you know physicists thinking about the Big Bang and the origin of the universe. Just to summarise the point of that, entropy isn't that problematic when counterposed with Einstein's theory of relativity, because even though we've got one direction 
of time, at least in the Einstein's theory of relativity, as you said, we can locate when and where we are, even though it's relative. And then this direction of time from uh, the Big Bang till now, for example, the hour time and how entropy increases, that's also compatible with Einstein's theory of relativity. Yeah, it is completely correct. The fact that entropy is increasing over time and giving time a direction is completely compatible with relativity, but it's not trivial. <laughs> it's not obvious. Einstein, what Einstein is, is telling us is that, let's, let's think of it this way, there's two different roles that time is playing. There, there may be more than two, but at least two. One is, time is what we personally experience. You know, we are human beings, or even if you had inanimate objects, we persist through time. We can carry a clock with us, or we can see time going by. We can measure what happens to ourselves. So it's sort of a label on our personal location in the universe. But then there's also time is being used as a coordinate, a way of labeling everything in the universe, what is happening all at once. And in Isaac Newton's view of the world, there was no difference between these two things. There was just one thing called time, and you measured it with your clock, and the universe measured it all over the place. And Einstein comes along and says, actually, there's, there's separate, these two concepts. The time that you experience as you travel through the universe might not be the same time that somebody else experiences. That's where the word relativity comes from. It's relative to how you are moving. So it all does fit together. I mean, there's not any, uh, any tension or any incompatibility or paradox in fitting in our personal experience of time with Einstein's notion of space and time being one thing, but you have to do some math to get there. So we know how to do that. That's not a major unanswered challenge, but it is, you know, a little bit of work to show that it all hangs together nicely. Sure, as quite an established and renowned physicist, I'll take your word on the math there, Sean. <laughs> so it, even though we can have the past, present and the future all there as one space-time block in the Einsteinian version, we can also have a unique history going back to the Big Bang. Yep, that's absolutely right. Now, um, how does time become more problematic when we look at aspects of quantum mechanics? Obviously, there's a lot of talk of unifying Einstein's theory with quantum mechanics. Many people think that quantum gravity is the key. How does time here in quantum mechanics help us understand the more fundamental notions of time or how do they make them even more complicated? I think quantum mechanics hurts us <laughs> a little bit. Quantum mechanics opens up a new way that time can be mysterious in a way that it's less mysterious in classical mechanics. And we don't know here. I mean, that now we're in an area where we, we really do start struggling with things we don't yet understand. So many times, you know, people are a little bit sloppy about what quantum mechanics actually implies. Quantum mechanics says that if you have an electron orbiting a hydrogen atom, then the energy of that electron only comes in certain discrete allowed units, right? It's not that it can be doing anything at once. There's energy levels in the hydrogen atom, and the electron is in one of those energy levels or a superposition of many of them. But this is why when the, the hydrogen atom emits radiation, it comes in very, very crisp, well-defined energies. So there's, that's where the quantization comes from. And therefore, people very naturally wonder, well, maybe space itself is quantized. It comes in little discrete packets. And if that's true, maybe time itself is quantized and it comes in little discrete packets. But none of that is known to be true or even, you know, we don't even have plausible arguments that that's true. So when it comes to quantizing space and time itself, we don't know how to do it. Uh, it might not be done. You know, in, if you take quantum mechanics at face value, quantum mechanics treats time and space differently. In Einstein's theory, time and space are on an equal footing, but quantum mechanics singles out time as special. And that may or may not be a fundamental truth of the world. That is what we don't yet know. It may be that time is special, but when you sort of reach this big macroscopic classical world in which we live, then you recover the symmetry that Einstein discovered. And so time might be continuous. Time might be real and continuous, just like Newton would have wanted it to be, after all. Uh, or time could be discrete and coming in little chunks. Or time might not exist as a fundamental notion at all. It, it might be that what you and I measure on our clocks is some emergent approximation to reality in exactly the same way that 
the temperature of the air in the room you're in is not a fundamental quantity. It's derived from the motion of the atom. Out of those three options that you stated there with regards to quantum mechanics, at this stage, obviously you haven't got a crystal ball. What one do you think is more likely, at least has more opportunity of being employed in wider scientific research? I wish I knew the answer to that. I think I'd be a more famous, well-known scientist if I had one point of view on that and I could just say it over and over again. But I'm up in the air. You know, is time continuous and and simple or is time uh, discrete and approximate or is time just emerging from something completely different I think all of these are on the table and I'm very open-minded about it right now um, I, I, I guess if I had to bet my favorite models right now are ones where time is simple and continuous and it's just like we always thought it was um, and that only makes sense to me if time does not have a beginning so in the Big Bang Theory, you know, something happens 14 billion years ago where we were in this hot, dense, rapidly expanding state. And according to classical general relativity, Einstein's theory of space and time, that was a singularity. That was the beginning of time right there. And so many words have been said and much ink has been spilled about what that means, the singularity at the beginning of time. And in quantum mechanics, it probably just is no singularity. In quantum mechanics, at face value, once again, time goes forever. It goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this moment in the history of the universe we call the Big Bang, if that view holds up, was just a phase. It was just a temporary thing that was happening in the universe, but really time itself was chugging along all the way. That's my favorite perspective view right now but i won't be held to it if i want to change my mind tomorrow i'm just going back to one of those other elements that time could be something completely different and fundamental in itself what would that entail that would be really interesting and amazing it is something people have been thinking about for a long time without quite putting together a coherent picture but the basic idea is to take advantage of quantum mechanics quantum mechanics says that you know again if you have an electron moving through space there's no such thing as where the electron is. There is where you might observe it, there's some probability, but really the electron is in a superposition, a sum of all the different possible places it can be. So that's a new thing in quantum mechanics that is not true in classical mechanics, that any system, any, any little bit of reality can be a, sort of a combination of many little bits doing different things, different possibilities. So that opens a way to get something like time out of your theory, even if time is not a fundamental ingredient. Because basically the, the, the strategy is to say, here's the universe, it's full of stuff. I'm going to isolate, I'm going to separate out one little bit of the universe, which I'm going to call the clock. And then I have the entire rest of the universe. And there's two things going on. Number one, my clock is not reading something specific, like, you know, 1230. It's in a superposition of every possible reading and then the rest of the universe is doing something that is correlated with what the clock is doing so when the clock if the clock reads 12 then the universe is doing one thing if the clock reads 1230 the universe is doing something else and so forth so rather than the usual view of time where the universe happens over and over again like uh, frames in a film strip or pages in a book this view says that the whole universe exists, period. It's not existing at different moments of time. It just all is there. And there's different labels on it corresponding to what you and I would call the different moments of time. But they're actually all there at the same time in some big quantum mechanical superposition. Just going back to the element you said before that about time perhaps always being there and before the Big Bang, is that the kind of stuff that would relate to um, cyclic models of the universe? A lot of people think there was something before the Big Bang, something like Neil Turek's work in Membrane Theory, where people think that time didn't just come out of the singularity in the Big Bang, but time actually existed before the Big Bang. Yes, it's exactly like that. Um, there's different versions of how you could get time before the Big Bang. So Neil Turok, Paul Steinhardt have been working on what they call the cyclic model, where there's sort of a universe that goes over and over again. Uh, and actually, I'm not a big fan of the cyclic model myself, because even though there are cycles that go forever, um, there's still one uniform arrow of time. So the cycles are not individually symmetric. You know, there's a, there's a beginning to everyone and an end, and it's obvious which is the beginning and which is the end. So in my mind, you can't take 
a situation like that and extrapolate it infinitely far into the past. That means that you know there was a beginning and there's a beginning before the beginning and a beginning before that, and that, that doesn't make sense to me. So I and others have been pushing a more symmetric view of the universe where there's some moment of time in what we would call the past where the entropy was the lowest it ever was. And toward one, from one direction of time going out from there, entropy increases. And in the other direction, entropy also increases. So rather than one arrow of time that goes uniformly throughout the whole universe, there is one in the future of this moment and one in the past of this moment, and they point in opposite directions. So the far, far, far future of the universe looks similar to the far, far, far past, just reversed in time. You've assessed why the cyclic universe still has a problem with this arrow of time that can't be done away with. How do you feel about the work of uh, someone like uh, Lee Schmolin, which is similar to uh, Julian Barber, which is time is really more about shape configurations and the changes in shape dynamics in space. That's what constitutes time. I, I know that's a very general overview of what, it, what a physicist would think of time, but how, how do you feel about that and that work on time? You know, I think it's interesting. I think it's important that they're doing it. It's not my my um, pick for the most promising way forward, because I just think that, you know, when you talk, there's a certain point of view that says that we should make progress by thinking about space-time in a more profound way. And I think that uh, Lee and Julian Barber, um, as people who are trained in general relativity, they very naturally take this point of view. Uh, I was kind of trained in general relativity myself, but I'm more sympathetic to quantum mechanics being the most fundamental theory that we have. So my point of view is much more that space and time are both going to emerge from something completely different. So thinking about shape dynamics and um, general relativity and what space is doing, I mean, I could be wrong. That it, it might turn out to be the best way forward, but I want to think about wave functions and quantum states and entanglement and things like that. I think that's more likely to give us a fundamental clue. And with that in mind, obviously, as a researcher at Caltech, what's currently on your, on your research agenda, whether it's in time or your general academic research in the physics? There's lots of things going on. Um, I'm very interested these days in these fundamental questions in, the, in quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics has been around since the 1920s, essentially, in its modern form. Uh, and yeah, in 10 years, it'll be a, a century old, and still we don't understand it. We don't understand our own theory, and that's a very embarrassing state of affairs, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm undergoing this debate right now with a bunch of very, very smart, well-known people uh, over email about what happens inside a quantum mechanical state. Remember, I already said, in quantum mechanics, the world can be in a superposition of many different things at once. So is each element in the superposition actually happening or is only the whole superposition considered as a, a set of things actually happening? This sounds like kind of a trivial linguistic philosophical question, but it actually has important ramifications for making predictions in cosmology. So again, it's, it's this very straightforward question to ask that could have been asked 90 years ago and we still know the answer to it and you know the the best minds thinking about quantum mechanics are confused by this simple question so i think that we're not going to understand the origin of the universe the nature of time and so forth until we understand these basic questions about how quantum mechanics work so essentially from your own research and what you think will clarify this area going forward is essentially getting to grips better with quantum mechanics and perhaps redefining aspects of space and time. Have you got any papers coming out in this area? Uh, I have a couple papers that just did come out. Um, one on deriving the so-called Born rule in quantum mechanics. The Born rule named after Max Born is the famous rule that says the probability of seeing an event happen is given by the wave function squared. The wave function is how we talk about you know what the electron is doing or whatever. It's a it's a number at every point all over the places the electron could be, and you take it and you square it, and that gives you the probability of seeing the electron there. So why is that true? Why is the probability given by the wave function squared? That was one paper that I wrote, and it you know it you need to answer questions about, well, why is one thing coming true and not another thing? Why do you observe some aspects and not others? And then the other that I wrote was about uh, the so-called Boltzmann brain problem. This is an idea that has been 
batted around for about 10 years now that if you if we wait a, you know 10 to the 100 years some hugely long period of time our universe is going to empty out right we live in a universe that is not only expanding but accelerating there's dark energy what we think is a cosmological constant that is just pushing the universe apart so it's not going to recollapse it's going to expand forever and empty out and then that empty space will last forever as far as we know, that's our best current prediction. And in that empty space, there's an idea that there can be quantum mechanical fluctuations, just random things happening like an electron and a positron popping into existence out of nothingness. And if that can happen, then basically anything can happen. <laughs> a person can pop into existence out of nothingness or a whole galaxy can pop into existence out of nothingness. And if that's true, you know, why don't we live there? Why do we live in this, you know, nice, warm, post-Big Bang cosmological era? So maybe there is no such era to the history of the universe where it's just empty space forever. Or maybe we're not understanding how quantum fluctuations really work. And so that's what I was proposing, that really we need to rethink our whole notion of quantum mechanical fluctuations. And again, a very simple, basic question that we can ask, but... You don't, you're not pushed to demand an answer until you think about the large scale history of the universe in this big picture kind of way. You've also known very well, actually, in popular science area. Got a book from Eternity to Here from a few years ago, and also the uh, particle at the end of the universe, I believe it was. The, the Higgs boson book that you did was interesting. You're also here in the UK doing some talks for, in collaboration with the uh, Guardian newspaper about the Higgs boson. So um, what have you got coming up in terms of public lectures in science? So any more popular books coming up? I don't have any more popular books coming out um, in the near future. I am taping a set of uh, video lectures uh, and audio also for The Great Courses. It's a company here in the U.S. where they have uh, college professors do these courses and they record them and then, you know, it's any college course you would have wanted to take. So I've done courses on dark matter and dark energy. I did one on the arrow of time and now I'm doing one on the Higgs boson. Uh, so that should come out, I don't know, maybe around Christmas time or next year. And it's great because it just reaches a very different audience. It's not the, it's not the book buying audience. Uh, there are people either, you know, very, very young people who listen to these on their headphones while they're at the gym or, you know, older people who say, you know, I'm retired now. I want to go back to college and learn all these things for, for once.